Namaskara from Citizens for Citizens or C4C. Here we are again with yet another C4C conversations program. Today's program is a heart to heart talk with a highly acclaimed cardiologist. I welcome all of you to this program. And on behalf of us, I welcome Dr. Sanjay Mehrotra, Senior Consultant Cardiologist from Bengaluru's globally well-known hospital, Narayana Hrudayalaya. Before we start, I request all to keep your audio on mute. And also, if you have any questions or feedback, please type it briefly in the chat section. At the end of his talk, Dr. Sanjay Mehrotra will answer some of these questions. And if there is time, we will request him to answer a few questions directly from you. As always, C4C founder and convener, Rajkumar Dugar, will give a very brief update about C4C and its activities, followed by a quick introduction of Dr. Sanjay Mehrotra. So Raj, please go ahead with your initial words. Yeah, Namaskara. This is the seventh episode of C4C Conversations in as many months. Until now, we have covered topics from history of Bengaluru, Bengaluru's pete and kote, segregation of waste, our respiratory system, e-services by government of Karnataka, and animal welfare all by relevant experts in the respective fields. Today, we are indeed happy that an eminent cardiologist who has been with Narayana Hridayalaya for about two decades is giving us his heart-to-heart -heart talk for our benefit. Before that starts, let me take a couple of minutes for a very brief overview of Citizens for Citizens or C4C and its activities. C4C's aim is to leave our surroundings a little better than we found it. In this regard, we have been working in close coordination with various government agencies, people's representatives, media, social media, etc., to move towards our goal of improving quality of life in Nama Bengaluru. We try and understand different aspects of the situation from all stakeholders and work towards solutions with positivity as our mantra. Our small, passionate teams on various subjects also work in the field where we do make a difference. C4C's focus has been on a wide range of subjects which include, but are not limited to, traffic congestion and public transport, afforestation, elimination of dark spots, black spots, and yellow spots, resolution of public issues with BBMP, BESCOM, BWSSB, BMTC, BMRCL, BTP, Southwestern Railways, etc. The credibility that C4C has built up over the past almost two years gives us confidence and does make our work a little easier than without that credibility. And we are satisfied with the success that we have achieved until now, which also motivates us to do more, for which indeed there is a huge scope. Air pollution, noise pollution, water pollution are taking a toll on our health, and we are trying to work on these two. Trains to airport were started on 4th Jan this year in response to long pending demand from us, as well as other concerned citizens, and although these have been temporarily suspended due to some maintenance work by FWR, they will resume later this week. And we hope people of Bengaluru will patronize them more, which will result in improvement in these services. Work on Bengaluru's suburban train project is set to take off soon. Also, a new railway terminal at Bayapanahalli is ready for inauguration in the next few weeks. We are on the verge of succeeding in persuading BMTC to provide feeder services between Kaban Park Metro and Vasant Nagar. We expect this to start soon. But these are big matters, but C4C also looks into relatively smaller or local issues of public interest. We took up the lack of pedestrian crossing of Palace Road at Chalukya Junction, and that has been solved a couple of weeks ago with the inclusion of a 15 second slot in the traffic cycle, specifically for pedestrians to cross Palace Road. A road was in the dark for several years due to lack of street lights and defective street lights. We persisted for solution in the ward committee meetings, and the road was finally fully lit up last week with repair of defective and installation of new street lights. And all the 250 families on Edward Road are indeed happy to see the change. 
Over two dozen issues are being discussed and tackled on the ward committee platform. And we encourage citizens, all citizens, to actively engage themselves in these no, local no, ward no, committees no, no, for resolution no, no, of problems. Well, no, 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 I too am keen to learn more about one of the most important organs of our body, indeed our existence. And so with this I I now request Madhu Bhatnagar to take us to the heart-to-heart -heart talk by Dr. Sanjay Mehrotra. Over to you, Madhu. Thanks, Raj, for that brief overview about C4C. Now, for the benefit of all, I will give a brief introduction about Dr. Sanjay Mehrotra, although he has a very vast experience. So, Dr. Sanjay Mehrotra is a coronary intervention specialist in the Department of Cardiology at Narayana Hrudayalaya, Bangalore. He has about 30 years of experience in his medical field. Dr. Sanjay Mehrotra completed his MBBS in 1983, his MD in internal medicine in 1987, and DM in cardiology in 1991 from GSVM Medical College, Kanpur. After completing DM cardiology, Dr. Mehrotra worked as visiting fellow at St. Luke's Hospital, Texas Heart Institute, USA, during 1991 to 92. He has been senior registrar at Western General Hospital, Edinburgh, UK, during 1992 to 95. From 1995 to 2001, he was associate professor of cardiology at St. John's Medical College and Hospital, Bengaluru. And during the last two decades, he has been with Narayana Shudharayalaya, which as all, all of us know, is a globally famous heart hospital. Dr. Sanjay's special interest in interventional cardiology is endovascular treatment of diseases of the aorta. Other interests include myocardial septal ablation, carotid interventions, peripheral interventions, and also complex coronary interventions, percutaneous aortic valve implantation, etc. He has presented numerous papers and given talks all over India and also abroad, including Japan, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Italy, USA, Singapore, etc., on a range of topics covering his subjects. Some of you, I'm sure, have met him or heard of him earlier. And today, C4C is indeed privileged to have Dr. Sanjay Mehrotra speak to us heart to heart. Over to you, Dr. Sanjay Mehrotra. Thank you, Madhu, and thank you, Raj uh, and Anandi for uh, these kind words. And first of all, I should congratulate you for the kind of work you do, uh, which is amazing. I mean, we, of course, do work for selfish uh, interest mm. of diseases and, and our personal, uh, you know, professional growth, but you do work for others, which is very, very important. Uh, thank you once again, Raj Kumar, and my pleasure to talk to this audience, which is a, a, a general group of, group of audience. And I'm going to talk to you about my experience and learning about uh, how and why do we get heart disease and how we can prevent it. And this is a heart to heart talk. Um, let's begin. Uh, so as you see that we are human beings which are made up of uh, various kinds of structures and the most important part of the magical machine, the machine, we are teens and we live on energy supplied by fat and glucose which we eat. So what is the function of the proteins in our body? And I'm, I'm sure everybody understands what proteins are. The proteins make the structure of our body. And as you all know that 70% of our body is nothing but water. And the structure of the body, which is our skin, our eyes, our hair, our every part of the body, all organs are made up of proteins. Now, what is the function of glucose? Glucose is like petrol for our body and we, <coughs> are living on this glucose, which is converted into energy by the cells of the body. Now, 
what is the function of the fats in the body? The fats are the store of the energy, which may be utilized at the time of need. And they also give shape and contour to our body. So if you look at our body, our body has gastrointestinal system. These are the various systems of the body. And I'm sure everybody's aware about it. Then we have cardiorespiratory system. We have nervous system. We have reproductive and excretory system. And I'm pretty sure all of you know uh, to some extent what is the function of this. Our gastrointestinal system is basically by which we ingest food or eat food. The food is first broken into small pieces in our stomach and then is assimilated in the body through the intestine. And what is not needed is excreted. Now the function of the cardiorespiratory system, of course, the cardiac function is nothing but to provide a blood which is pumped from the heart to every part of the body. And the function of the blood is to carry various food particles, food matter, as well as various enzymes and hormones to various parts of the body. Now, what does the lungs do? And all of us know that the lungs actually make us breathe. We ingest, we take oxygen inside and the oxygen is utilized for the functions of the cell. Now, nervous system, which is connected to our, this big thing sitting in our head called the brain, is connected to each and every cell of the body, which is the main control of all the functions of the body. It's like the head office. And whatever products of the body which is not utilized are either excreted uh, through the urine or we pass them through our motions. And of course, the function of the reproductive system is to procreate and move our generation forward. Now coming to the main important topic, topic, that what is heart disease and how does it affect us? And why there is so much of heart disease? And this is something which is important for us, all of us to understand. We live in a country where there is continuous increase in the incidence of diabetes and heart disease. So much so that we are called as the diabetic capital of the world. Now, coming to the next slide, now, most of you will probably know what is heart attack and what is angina. What is heart attack? What are the symptoms of the heart attack? How is a heart attack treated? Is there any way to reduce the chance of a heart attack? And I'm pretty sure that almost 100% of the population has heard this word heart attack. And I'm going to give you some insight into that. And then we'll go how to prevent it. As all of you know that heart is an organ which is situated in our chest and its job is to pump blood into the body because every part of the body is needing blood. And the blood is distributed through these channels which are called as arteries. Now these arteries which are going from through this big vessel called aorta are supplying blood and food to every cell of the body. Now, heart also needs blood for itself, and that is supplied by these red colored small arteries of the heart, which we call it coronary arteries. And there are three kinds of main coronary arteries. Now, the problem lies in the fact that these arteries, as we grow old, and unfortunately, at starting from the 10 years of life, 10 years of life, start getting thickened and deposited with the flat fat. And that process is called as atherosclerosis. Now, if you look at this picture, this is a normal artery and this is an abnormal artery. So if you see the normal artery, it has got that white part is through which the blood flows and it is the wall of the artery. And if you see on the right side, this arterial wall has become thicker this structure which gets deposited inside, it's called as atheroma. And this is responsible for causing heart attack in us. Now, what it does is that this atheroma tends to cause narrowing of the lumen. Lumen means the place through which the blood flows. And when it becomes very, very narrow, obviously the blood flow will become less through that narrowed portion. 
And this in a uh, lower diagram is something like that, which is impinging on the lumen of the artery. It is like a fat, like very, you know, like a soft substance, which is we call as plaque. Now, it is all right to have these plaques, but what is the reason that people get angina? What is the reason people get heart attack? And what are its complications? And why does this atherosclerosis develop? And this is what I'm going to tell you in this slide. So if you look at, this is the normal artery. This is the abnormal artery. Now, what happens is that this plaque, which you see, for some unknown reason, although we understand most of it now, gets broken. Broken means it burst open. When it burst open, the content of this plaque, which are basically fat, which are cholesterol and certain cells, they come out. So here is an artery which has got a broken atheroma. And you see this red thing is the blood clot, which is formed inside. Now, when this happens, this whatever lumen or whatever the passage which is left gets completely clogged and the artery get completely blocked and you suffer a heart attack. So when the artery would get completely blocked, there would be no blood flow. So imagine this tube, which I told you about, let me just go back. So if you see this artery, this artery of support, there is a plaque inside and we are showing the cross section of those arteries only in this. If there is a narrowing right here or right here, if that narrowing at that plaque gets ruptured, it produces blockage of the artery. So the flow, blood flow downstream will stop and the portion of the heart which is supplied by that artery will suffer a damage. And this is called as a heart attack. Now, here I'm gonna show you that is what has happened. Now, fortunately, we have technology now by which we can see all these things. So if you look at, this is a picture of the same artery, which is obtained by something called as OCT. We call it optical coherence tomography. And this is a plaque. This is a normal artery, just below the normal artery here. This is a narrowed artery. And this is a ruptured plaque. All these things we can see now. Now, when you develop these uh, heart attacks, what actually is happening is that this plaque for some unknown reason, which we don't very well understand, gets ruptured. And that is what is causing the heart attack. Now, why does this plaque rupture is something very important to understand. And I will give you some insight into it so that we can move forward. Now, as I said, that heart attack is caused by sudden blockage of one of these arteries the blood flow to the muscle stops completely. And this is what we call as a heart attack. I've already told you about it. Now, there are certain people who have a propensity for these block to rupture. Propensity means they have a vulnerability. Their plaques are more likely to rupture. Now, who are these people? And this is what probably now trying to understand in science also. So if the plaque is there and it doesn't rupture or it doesn't cause a problem, you don't get heart attacks. What you usually get is because of the presence of the plaque, your arteries passage has become narrowed. So when you will walk a bit, only when you will strain a bit or you will climb say three floors of a building, that narrowed portion of the artery is not going to allow more blood to pass through it. See, whenever we are sitting at rest, the amount of blood needed by our body, which has to be pumped by the heart, is very small. We require about, say, two liters of blood per minute. But when you have to walk fast and we have to carry some weight or we have to run a bit faster, our body, our muscles require more blood. And that has to be provided by this heart. Heart has to pump not only now two liters, heart has to pump maybe four liters of blood per minute. This is what we call as a cardiac output. Now, if there is a blockage in one of the tubes of the heart, that tube would not be able to supply the required amount of blood to that muscle, which is trying to pump more. And in that position, a person gets a discomfort in his chest. So you must have heard that when I walk a bit fast, 
and while carrying some weight, I get a symptom of some kind of a suffocation in my chest or a heavy feeling in my chest. So this is a sign of angina. So a lot of people can have angina without suffering a heart attack and that is fine because angina is just a symptom causing discomfort to you and probably giving a trouble to you when you walk. So your quality of life will come down but you will not suffer a damage because heart attack is a damaged heart. So, so far you have angina, it is all right. When you have a heart attack, your muscle will get damaged. If the muscle will get damaged, that damage is permanent. It is not going to recover. And that is why we say that when your heart, when you're suspecting heart attack, don't take a chance, go to the hospital, and gets yourself treated. You know why? Because if you don't open that artery within the next six hours, that muscle of the heart will get permanently damaged, will not recover ever in the future. And you will be living with a weakened heart. This weakened heart is a liability. And imagine somebody who is 30 years of age, who is a smoker, suffers a heart attack, what will be the quality of life of his himself as well as family because it reflects on your earning capability, it reflects on your working capability and that is why important. Now, some of these plaques which I talked about are soft plaque and they have inflammation. Inflammation means they're more likely to rupture. And these are the plaques where they're usually young plaques they are more common in people who have very high cholesterol. They are more common in people who smoke. The most common cause of an early plaque rupture is a smoking. Those people who smoke, their plaque ruptures very quickly. And that is why sometimes we see a heart attack in a young person, 30 years of age, who's got no other risk factors except smoking. That is why we say smoking is a bad thing. The other thing which can happen is because these plaques are very soft and they are exposed to a high blood pressure. So suppose you are somebody who has a soft plaque sitting in your heart somewhere mm -hmm. and you do extreme rage, extreme anger. What happens or you do some kind of extreme activity sure like going to the gym. And please, I request all of you to please mute Mr. Om Blue Prakash. Uh, there are people who are not muted, like Kavita, Om My Prakash. Name? Can they mute, please? My name? My name? My name? That's Kumar, you can Kabini. mute them probably one more time. I, yeah. They unmute yeah. themselves again and again. Yeah. So can you hear me now? Yes. So now what one experiences during the heart attack, and this is what I wanted to tell you, is that sometime during the heart attack, you will feel some discomfort in your chest with sometimes suffocation and some people will sweat. Now sweating which happens without these symptoms are not to be bothered. But if you feel along with sweating, a sensation of suffocation, which is very, very common in diabetics, but because many times diabetic patients do not feel pain. They just feel suffocation. You should not ignore it. And as I said, unfortunately, these things happen mostly at two o'clock in the morning where it is difficult to go to the hospital. Everybody is sleeping. And most of the people say, let me not bother anybody at home. We will see what's gonna happen in the morning. And that is very, very bad. That if you don't wake your family up and you, slip in the, you sleep in the night, next morning, six hours are gone and your damage is complete. It cannot be reversed. So you may feel sweating. You may have difficulty in breathing. Sometime if the heart attack is very big, you collapse. And the important thing is that this symptom will not get relieved by sorbitrate. Now it's very common for people to know about sorbitrate and they sometimes take the sorbitrate tablet and they actually drop their pressure while taking the sorbitrate. So 
we i recommend if you are sweating if you are feeling cold sweat you know you are feeling light headed you should not take the sorbitrate tablet because if you take sorbitrate tablet your blood pressure will drop further and you may collapse also recommended that take the sorbitrate table tablet while sitting don't take it while standing because your drop pressure will drop so people are very used to uh, taking sorbitrate and everybody knows there is a pill you can take what can save you from heart attack is taking a tablet of aspirin 325 mg of aspirin if you have at home it will reduce your risk of dying from heart attack by 25% and that is why we say that you should take aspirin the other very common sensation which happens to people is this sensation of uh, gas in the chest which is very very common people say gas gets stuck into my chest and that is usually not the gas it is caused by a heart attack you please ig don't ignore a gas like sensation in the chest go and see your doctor now as i said that what can be done to take take care of these heart attacks and the important thing which you can do is that you can go to a, a doctor or go to a hospital where they will give you a medicine where this clot which is forming here can be dissolved immediately and you can get rid of the damage caused by the heart attack so your heart attack can be reversed and the sooner you go if you go within 1 hour of having the chest discomfort your damage would not be permanent you will actually recover almost completely the most common treatment we do nowadays instead of giving this drug which is called as a clot buster or blood uh, dissolving clot dissolving medicine we go ahead and do an angioplasty to these patients and this angioplasty is called as a primary angioplasty angioplasty done to prevent heart attack and this is a patient is a 27 year old person who came with a heart attack and we have done an angioplasty and this is an oct image you see a ruptured plaque and at the bottom you will see that we have done in stenting for this patient and his heart attack is take, taken care of now what are the risk factors of heart disease and i come to the main important topic topic now which i think everybody should listen the most important cause of this disease getting worse is diabetes they are estimated to be 382 million people worldwide who have diabetes and i can quote that 60 to 70% of them live in india so how this diabetes and high blood pressure have become the curse of modern day life i am going to talk to you and the good news is that they are preventable and that is why we actually prevent them before they become a, 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 a terror for you or a cause of concern or a damage or a disease thing to you now as we said that the most important causes of the risk of diabetes are following as and i have enumerated here blood pressure is hypertension hyperlipidemia is high cholesterol diabetes is of course sugar which everybody knows then physical inactivity not doing physical activity that risk is almost most equal aging gradual and set tension obesity and of course genetic susceptibility but genetic susceptibility is also nothing but your socio cultural history what your families have eaten for three or four generation becomes your gene how your families have behaved for the last three four generation they become your genes and of course not to forget smoking now so diabetes high cholesterol or high lipidemia high blood pressure and high sugar they all lead to development of this process of atherosclerosis which is responsible for heart attack which is responsible for stroke because this thing blocks the brain arteries and it's also responsible blockages in other part of the body now i'm just going to spend a bit of time on why diabetes if you look at southeast asia and this is the data compared from year 2000 to a projected time in 2030 which is about 30 years of time and we are nearing 
there would be a 155% increase in prevalence of diabetes in Southeast Asia. And we are part of that. This is the largest increase and in why diabetes has increased so much. I'm gonna give you some background. Now, when we eat food, what happens to that food is important to understand. So in our food, there are three main components, which I discussed first uh, in my first slide, which is carbohydrate, which, is, which are called as sugars. We add, eat fats and we eat proteins. And these are called as macronutrients. And then you have something called as micronutrients. What are the micronutrients? Like vitamins, minerals, and some trace elements. Now, um, why diabetes is more common is because the insulin doesn't work in our body. The insulin's either deficient or we develop what you call as insulin resistance. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you what is insulin resistance. So the job of insulin, this is a cell of a body, uh, of a person, any cell, this can be a single cell. And this is the glucose, which is orange in color. It has to enter the cell for the cell to utilize glucose as a source of energy. It's like petrol for this engine, for this cell. Now, insulin job is that when insulin attaches to the cell, the insulin is a hormone, it's an enzyme, it's a chemical structure. When it attaches itself to the cell, the glucose can go inside and provide energy to the cell. But the glucose will be then metabolized and will produce energy. Now, what happens that, so the function of the insulin is to internalize glucose inside the body or inside the cell, to push it inside the cell. Now, most of us have no deficiency of energy or calories in the body. We have enough you know, energy inside our cells. So when you present with the cell with a lot of glucose, that means you have eaten at seven o'clock in the morning, a cup of tea with sugar, with two biscuits and something, then you have eaten at nine o'clock, then you have eaten something around 12 o'clock, then you have eaten something around four o'clock, then you have eaten something around seven o'clock and most of it is nothing but glucose because we eat most of the time wheat-based food which are rich in carbohydrates or, and we always eat sugar with it. So when there is too much of glucose or the sugar, the cell doesn't need it. Cell has got enough inside it. So what insulin does is that insulin converts this glucose into fat. And this is the cause of central obesity. So when there is too much of glucose, which is coming every four or five hours, the insulin is increasing every three hours in a body. So if you eat, suppose, suppose in the morning at eight o'clock, and then you ate at two o'clock, and then you ate it at nine o'clock, you will have three spikes of insulin. One within the next one hour, which is from eight to nine, then you will have one spike from 12 to two when you eat in 12 o'clock. Then you have eaten at eight o'clock, so you will have one more spike. Now insulin, whatever you have eaten, its job is to push this inside the cell. Now two things happen when you eat again at eight o'clock, again at nine o'clock, again at 12 o'clock, again at four o'clock, that there are multiple spikes of insulin. And this insulin becomes ineffective. And we call this condition as insulin resistance. And that is diabetes. So two things happen, first of all, you're exhausting in pancreas, producing so much of insulin. In a day, you're eating five times, six times, seven times. So your insulin is coming when going, coming and going. And the pancreas poor has sound certain capacity to provide this insulin. It cannot keep providing insulin for the rest of your life. So suppose a 20, a 15 year old boy has been eating like this till about 30 years of age, his insulin stores are gone and he will develop early diabetes. And that is the cause of early diabetes in this country. We are eating too much, we are eating too many times. And the most important food which eat, we eat is simple sugars. Unfortunately, our wheat has also become simple sugar. 
our rice has become single sugar because it's been changed. It's been now designed in such a way, it's been hybridized. It has a lot of carbohydrates. And when you buy a processed rice or processed wheat, what it does, it, it pulverizes the companies which the machines are used to pulverize the wheat, remove all the germ layer, remove all the husk. So it is as good as taking simple sugars. So you're actually taking simple sugars. And the worst thing which you do is drink these cold drinks, aerated drinks, they have so much of sugar. They have fructose and that is directly responsible for causing accumulation of glucose in the form of fat in the liver. So that is why if you do ultrasound of people nowadays, all of them have fatty liver. That's because they're eating too much of sugar. And that is ultimately responsible for causing this process of atherosclerosis. So the most important learning from this is that insulin resistance is the cause of causing diabetes. Our insulin doesn't work. There is too much of insulin and that exhaustion. And when there is too much of sugar coming inside, this gets converted into fat, which gets collected in our face on the cheeks, which gets collected in our abdomen, and we all have central obesity. Our abdomen comes out. And I'm surprised that if you sit at the airport nowadays, everybody who is above 20 years of age has a small paunch in front of him. And this is, you can't find a young man who is without paunch. Everybody is looking into his phone with a paunch inside. And this is the cul, which is the worst thing which we are doing to ourselves. So if you don't educate people about it, and people can lose weight very quickly if you educate them. So I educate them about it, and I'm going to tell you something about it in the next uh, 20 minutes. So this syndrome of central obesity, where your waist ratio is more than the hip ratio, is called as waist hip ratio, high blood pressure, diabetes, hypertriglyceridemia, your triglycerides are usually very high, and fatty liver is the worst scenario for getting diabetes and heart disease. And we call it metabolic syndrome. Coming to what is high blood pressure, this blood pressure is causing damage to your arteries. And imagine I told you, if you have a vulnerable plot, which is very easy, soft plot, you could do some rage and anger, the blood pressure goes up, it causes a pressure in your arteries and the artery bursts open, causing a heart attack. And that is the most important cause. So the blood pressure damages your heart, it damages your brain, it damages your kidneys. And most of the people who become hypertensive and a lot of people are becoming hypertensive early age, especially a 25 year old fellow when he comes to me, he says, doctor, if you give me medicine now, I'll have to take the whole rest of my life medicine. The answer is that who has got the blood pressure? You, not me. So you have to take medicine or you lose this weight and you don't need to take medicine. So, and, but if you have blood pressure, if somebody has blood pressure at 25 years of age, if you leave it untreated, he will die by 55 years of age of kidney disease. And that is why this is a very important message that all those people who have blood pressure, please treat that blood pressure, bring it down. If you want to bring it down by lifestyle modification, changing your weight, changing your ex doing exercise, fine, but reduce the blood pressure. If you can't do it, take a medicine. And when you do that, stop the medicine. When you lose 10 kgs of weight, your blood pressure will come down by at least 15 degrees, 100%. There's no doubt about it. Now, what is cholesterol? So cholesterol is nothing but it is a particle which carries fat inside the body. So when I said that, that glucose which gets converted into fat, the transportation of this fat from the blood to liver, from the blood to below your skin, from the blood into your paunch, from the blood into your cheeks is done by cholesterol. So cholesterol is carrying and depositing, carrying and depositing. So when you have too much of fat, you have too much of cholesterol, or you have this bad cholesterol, then you have a possibility of suffering with this atherosclerotic process. And I have given these values, which I'm not going to talk about because this we can discuss later. Now, how do we prevent heart disease and diabetes and obesity? And this is important to learn. The most important cause of disease is food, dietary risk. Disease is not caused by corona. The most important cause of killing is dietary risk. Look at this. Dietary risk is the biggest risk judged from 1990 to 2016. Tobacco, high blood pressure, high body mass index, 
high fasting glucose, total cholesterol, kidney disease, alcohol, air pollution, physical activity, occupational risk, bone density, um, uh, all kinds of stuff, all sanitation, unsafe water, sexual abuse, violence is all very low. What is at the top? Dietary risk. Dietary risk means what we eat is the most important cause of disease. Now, how do we prevent this? So as I said, cardiovascular diseases, diseases which are caused by heart ailments and this vascular disease, which is the blocking of the arteries by the process of atherosclerosis, they are the leading cause of death across the world. And can it be prevented? Yes, the answer is it can be prevented. But what do you have to prevent? You have to control the risk. You have to prevent occurrence of diabetes. You have to prevent occurrence of obesity. And that is important. Now, if you look at what are the most important risk factors for heart disease and heart attack? Abdominal obesity, visceral obesity, collection of fat in your abdomen is the most important risk. High blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, psychosocial involvement and smoking. These are the most important risk factors. Now, ethnicity, which is your genetics, age, we can't change, gender, we can't change. As males, we are more prone to, and of course, family history. According to me, family history is nothing but what your five generation from the mother's side and your father's side has brought with them as a culture. That becomes your genes because the way they, their ancestors have eaten, they will transmit the same kind of eating pattern in you, the same kind of attitude in you, the same kind of mind in you because they have come with a background of their minds. And that is why uh, you know, the mind also becomes important and I will give probably one minute on the mind aspect as well, because mind is the most important organ of your body, a uh, part of your body, the brain. Now, what is important is that if you have high cholesterol, you should use statins. There has been some WhatsApp based information that statins are not good for you. The answer is statins are the most uh, commonly used agents to prevent atherosclerosis, adequate treatment of diabetes, adequate treatment of high blood pressure, timely treatment of the heart attack. It's very important to reach to the hospital at a certain time. And if required, adequate interventions like bypass, angioplasty to improve your quality of life. I must say that the lifestyle modification is the number one method by which you can change your disease, not by doing a bypass and not by doing an angioplasty. So if you do a bypass, but you don't change your lifestyle, don't change your eating patterns, it's not gonna help you, it'll come back. So what I say, drug treatment, heart attack treatment, bypass, coronary intervention, but the most important is lifestyle modification. Now, what is high blood pressure? I have talked about it. It causes damage to your eyes. It causes stroke. It causes heart attack. It causes kidney damage. It causes vascular damage. And of course, as I said, blood pressure treatment is important. Smoking is the number one thing you can stop from today because that's easy. You, you don't smoke, your risk goes up, it goes down, but it'll take about a year for the risk to go down. So it's the most easily modifiable risk factor that if you stop smoking, your risk of heart disease will come down. And I can tell you, if I get a heart attack patient at 30 years of age, 99% he'll be a smoker. It's very unlikely he'll be not a smoker. He will not have any other risk factor, just smoking. And these people have vulnerable plaques, very soft plaques, which are only 30, 40% narrow. Their arteries are not 70% narrow and they suffer a heart attack. Now, alcohol consumption, this question is asked by many people all the time and small amount of alcohol is not bad. So we actually don't stop people who drink one or two drinks per day or, or one or two glasses of wine per day, but we don't tell them to start drinking if they don't drink. Large amount of drinking causes fat collection and calories and raises your blood pressure. If you drink four drinks per day, uh, it has multiple bad effects on the body. And unfortunately, which we see so common now, women have started drinking more than that, what was 30 years, 40 years ago. And the, it affects the women much, much more than men, unfortunately. Now, what causes obesity? And this is an important topic. I'm gonna just spend a bit more time on that. So it's, People used to think that if you eat a lot of calories, you will get obese. Now, we've all done, and I think if you ask uh, everybody, you said, yes, sir, I hardly eat anything, but my weight doesn't come down. 
you don't eat but your calories uh, your weight doesn't come down you may lose some weight when you reduce your calories but the weight will not go because your requirement comes down so if you are somebody who take 2000 calories per day and you reduce it to 1500 calories per day the body will get adjusted to that 1500 and will not lose weight now so by reducing calories you may not lose weight and i said that the most important substance which is responsible for causing obesity is insulin so what do you need to do when you have to reduce the amount of insulin surges in your body which i told you about and before i go into that this is the insulin effect when you take a breakfast when you take a lunch when you take dinner so suppose you are eating every 2 hours the insulin which is getting secreted in your body is going to cause more and more fat accumulation so the importance of fasting in our communities importance of uh, you know when our ancestors our grandmothers used to fast almost every 15 days that's very very important and all of you must have heard about what is intermittent fasting now all those substances and carbohydrate which increase insulin secretion very quickly are called as high glycemic index products like they will and something which is of low glycemic index that is less than 55 medium is 56 to 69 and high is more than 70 for example if you eat sugar it will increase your insulin quickly but that habit of mixing lime habit of eating vinegar with food or habit of eating fermented food reduces the glycemic index that means when you take that sugar it will not cause the insulin rise so when you reduce the insulin spikes and the carbohydrate has become the most important cause of high risk in mortality this is a study published in uh, lancet about 3 years ago called pure trial which proved that those communities which take high carbohydrate intake are associated with high risk of death i'm not going to go into the details of it so when you have multiple spikes of insulin you're going to accumulate more and more fat and that is why i say that you should keep i would recommend my patient not to eat re repeatedly now the nutritionist advice to a diabetologist diabetic patients is absolutely opposite they say eat small multiple meals this is wrong this will change the nutritionists don't understand it the dietitians don't understand it and even the um, even the doctors don't understand it this is going to change in the next 2 years or 3 years they will start telling you fast and reduce your sugar now as i said that when you eat again and again there is high insulin level in the blood it causes insulin resistance or diabetes which leads to atherosclerosis heart disease and brain disease when you eat high fructose and glucose which lead to non alcoholic liver cirrhosis fatty liver has become the most common cause of liver failure and of course it causes kidney disease it causes diabetic nephropathy so consumption of sugar is the worst thing you do to yourself stop eating sugars you will increase your life by at least 15 years i can guarantee it to you so what is a good food all colorful food is good food food especially kacha food especially uncooked food unfortunately kacha food is associated with transmission of infection because we don't get pure food we have pesticides we have so it's important to wash your vegetables and of course you can eat meat although i recommend my patients now a plant based diet i actually have started telling them stop eating meat you will live longer because there are certain reason for it i don't think i can cover all this in this talk but plant based diets are better diets um and the jain communities which um, rajkumar comes from i think so um he, they don't eat meat at all these are plant based diets fruits vegetables you can take eggs white on the eggs you can take uh, you know semi cooked food you can take nuts uh, almonds and these are all good for you they now how does the intermittent fasting works now you must have heard ki sab hum apna bariatric surgery kara lete hain we can let's get the bariatric surgery done now what is bariatric surgery is doing is nothing but cutting your stomach 
so that you can't eat, you can't absorb certain food. You can do it without that. How can you do it? Just don't eat too much. So those people who eat less live longer. And I recommend my patients to go this kind of pattern. I'll tell you this pattern. Um, I tell my patient that eat three meals per day for three days in a week, two meals per day and three days in a week and do one day of fasting per week. So, and don't eat in between. If you do have to, you start becoming hungry, drink something like this, drink buttermilk, drink vegetable and fruit juice. You can take black tea and coffee, take vegetable juice in between to avoid that insulin surge. These things will not increase insulin in your body. When they don't increase insulin, your diabetes will reverse. If you lose weight by doing this, your requirement will come down. Your drug requirement will come down. If your medicine is coming down, if you don't have to take medicine, that means your diabetes is getting better. And you, sugar control is only one aspect of diabetes. It's just a representation of diabetes. It is not curing diabetes. So it's important that you treat diabetes completely. Now, um, so these are low glycemic food index, vegetables, plants, and fruits. Glycemic index, which is in between corn, rice, and very high glycemic index. All these things which are on the right side. This, all the pastries, cakes, and sugars, and which you are, you know, the sugar industry has controlled the selling of food in this world. You enter a mall, the first thing you say is a cake shop. And young people enjoy cakes with coffee. Any drink, cocktail, mocktail, whatever you drink has nothing but syrup in it. That has got either, um, you know, Coca-Cola or a Sprite or some kind of lemonade, which is mixed with sugar. That is bad for you, 100%. Stop drinking all those things. Now, various kinds of diet. What is a Mediterranean diet? What is a ketogenic diet? I think I will probably answer questions rather than talk about them. So I will leave this question. And I said, this is my personal suggestion. Stop all simple sugars completely and all processed food. You should not eat anything which you have bought from the shelf, which has been used for pre-cooked or half-cooked or to be boiled, mixed with all kinds of salts and preservatives, trans fatty acids. They are the worst thing you drink. All the Maggie's and the syrups and the soups which you drink, buying from the shop or the bread for that matter is also bad for you. Now, coming to the body, mind, how your mind becomes your body. Your mind is the way the body behaves. You, there is a close association with how you think and that is what you become. How you think, then what you eat, how you behave, how much jealous you are, how much anxious you are, how much you abuse others, how much you harm others, it is responsible for causing disease. And if you harm others, 100% it'll come back to you. This change is called as epigenetics. So when you become a positive epigenetic man, if you change your mind in such a way that your food changes, you become more and more sattvic, then your disease will go away. The more tamasic you become, more disease will come to you 100%. There's no doubt about it. Now, how exercise and yoga help? Of course, they cause vagus stimulation. So your vagus nerves get activated. All meditative processes are responsible for controlling your autonomic nervous system. The vagus gets controlled. Some people call vagus as the kundalini. Vagus, when you can control, your kundalini gets energized and your, your body will become energized. And all the meditative processes, all the pranayams, they do nothing but it stimulate the parasympathetic system, the autonomic nervous system, working through the vagus. I don't know, God is so smart that he has made this cranial nerve, starts from the head, the cranial nerve, which starts from the brain and goes down to your pelvis, controls your sexual activities also through only one nerve. That is called as a vagus nerve. The sympathetic and the parasympathetic system, which are the autonomic nervous system, which are mostly ignored by the doctors are the most important aspect of the body. And all control of food, control of uh, you know, our physical activity, exercises, yoga, are nothing but streamlining the parasympathetic system. That is why mind is very, very important. And I would recommend that yoga is one of the best methods to do it. 
And of course you can do other exercise, but yoga is one of the best methods to do it. I have enough information about it. I don't think I can talk about it in this forum. Thank you very much for your attention. So I'll stop sharing here and I'll invite um, others to come and we have about, we have enough time to talk and I'm happy to answer questions if you have in, in, yeah. in, in yeah. after my talk. Yes, Rajkumar. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Sanjay. I'm really amazed today because, uh, uh, you know, this is a heart to heart talk and much about so many things which are relevant for the heart rather than the heart itself. I mean, it's really amazing. We normally thought that we, we thought that you will talk about the right ventricle, the left ventricle and other things. But uh, these are things which we need to know that how relevant these factors are for our heart. Thank you so much, first of all. And uh, I'd like to go to the chat section first. Uh, yep. We'll see if we have some points here and then we'll uh, open out for some questions. Um, there is one question from Arvind, which says, how long does a heart attack last? So normally the symptoms of heart attack will start showing discomfort in your chest in when an artery gets occluded. The effect will come immediate, immediately, but it gets established in about 20 minutes of time. The pain may persist anything from few hours to few days. If you get treated, if you reach hospital and the flow to that artery gets established, your pain will go away. So the pain can last from few minutes to hours. So the pain in an untreated patient will go away in about 24 hours. But the pain will start or a discomfort will start after 20 minutes of an occlusion of an artery. So when your heart artery is, is occluding or blocking, in within 20 minutes, the heart attack would establish. And if you can reach within one hour, you can prevent heart attack. Uh, doctor, you had said uh, that uh, if you eat regularly, means in uh, two hours, yeah, two hours, once in two hours, at this thing, the glucose level increases and uh, yeah, sorry, the insulin level increases and a uh, lot of work has to be done by the insulin. And uh, for the glucose, this thing, you had said recently. But yes. uh, other doctors, some doctors say that it is better to eat around uh, five to six times a day in small quantities than a large meal of three times a day. Any so just thing, all, one question. Yeah, all those doctors are primitive. They don't understand it. Okay, okay. okay. They're telling and you the, wrong advice and their advice has not worked. Nobody has lost weight by their advices. Okay, okay, doctor. And they follow up this thing, yes. And uh, recently, Saurav Ganguly was diagnosed with the thing. He had no history of any uh, drink or any, no history of any cigarettes and nothing. And still, he, uh, he had a heart attack. Any explanation for that, doctor? No, he. I'm pretty sure that he lives a very active lifestyle. Uh, these people visit that lifestyle. Their diets are very bad. I know Saurav is a was a smoker. Whether he smokes now or I don't know, but it's. You can ask a question, being an athlete and a fit player, why has he got heart disease? And my answer to that is that being fit is nothing, no, no you know, uh, confirmation that you will not have disease. Fitness is a different, physical fitness is required. But along with that, the kind of food you eat and the kind of mind you carry on your head is also important. So all the things are, three things are important. Fitness, physical activity, food and this which you have here. How do you behave in life? That's important. So I know what Saurav Ganguly has. And I mean, of course, his angiogram was seen by me. Um, and the, his, he, of course, underwent one more procedure. And I think he's doing well. But then he had blockages everywhere. Three arteries, he had blockages. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Sanjay, if you don't mind, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Rajkumar. I, I would like to take up these questions which are in the chat. Yes, yes. Part. So there yeah. is one question from Mangala Kumari. Will hyperthyroidism with high pulse rate of over 120 uh, lead to a heart attack? It can lead to a heart attack, especially if you have a disease in you existing. So nobody can suffer a heart attack without a pre-existing blockage. The process of blockage starts very early in your life, as I said. It starts when you're only about 10 years of age. Something which has become 90%, 
some 30 years ago or 20 years ago, it was less than 10%. So something which is growing slowly becomes 90%. So people who have these plaques, people who have these vulnerable plaques, uh, hyperthyroidism where there is increased activity of thyroid can lead to a heart attack. But I would suggest that you should control that hyperthyroidism by medicines. And then your chances of heart attack, even if you have a possibility, will be reduced. What about normally high pulse? So normal high pulse is a sign of physical inactivity. And again, that you know autonomic nervous system, it's called as a lack of heart rate variability, where your sympathetic system is always active and your parasympathetic system is less active. So people who have high heart rates are burning their energies more, but their heart is getting, uh, you know, used very oftenly. You know, as the animal advances its age, for example, a tortoise who lives sometime 400 years, it beats only 20 to 30 beats per minute. So the more you are fitter, the less will be your heart rate. So if your heart rate is low without any taking any drugs, then you are a fitter individual. individual. An athlete can have a 40 heart rate or a 50 heart rate. So lack, those people who have high heart rate, which call is resting tachycardia, is not good for you. Okay. It suggests that you require to improve your physical fitness. Okay. Uh, Dr. Manohar BS asks, uh, I had my bypass in 2009 and yes. I'm a candidate for vaccination shortly. Some suggest that I should only take Covishield instead of Covaxin. Is it true? And I'm on blood thinners and they say that I should stop it for four to five days during vaccination. Please advise. Yeah, I mean, there has been unnecessary concerns in people's mind about taking vaccine. I must tell you through this platform that all of you should take vaccine unless there is a specific need. You're taking anticoagulants, you're on a valve, you have a valve which is requires anticoagulant. In such situation, maybe you can stop for two days or three days and you can take it. Aspirin is no contraindication. All those people who have had bypass, if they take aspirin, they should take vaccination and don't worry about it. Vaccination is good for all of you. And protection from COVID, only way we have right now is vaccine. And both the vaccines are good. I have taken COVID shield and I have received two shots and nothing happened to me. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. There's somebody uh, whose name uh, just says iPad. Why does my BP show high when I take a reading, but after around 10 deep breaths, it comes down quite a bit to a very good reading. Why is this and which reading is the correct one? <laughs> so very good question. I, I must say that a lot of people who check their blood pressure, they should ignore their first two readings because the first reading is always high. The second reading is settled and the third reading is the best. Some of the BP instruments do not give you the readings now. They take three times blood pressure and give you reading. So my suggestion is you should sit for 10 minutes. You should not take your blood pressure just after eating food. You should not take your blood pressure just after coming from walking or exercise. You should rest for half an hour. Take once, ignore it. Take two, ignore it. Take the third reading and consider that as your real reading. And okay. consider that only is your blood pressure, not the first and second. Thank you. Uh, Chitra Venkatesh asks, is 220 cholesterol? I don't know what cholesterol she has not mentioned. Does it require medication? I assume it's a total cholesterol. I think 220 cholesterol is not a very high cholesterol. And the treatment of cholesterol is different in people who have disease versus who don't have disease. We go by LDL. Uh, LDL level is more important. So we look at the LDL level. Somebody whose LDL level is more than 130 and he has tried lifestyle modification. Now, the only problem is people cannot try lifestyle modification. It's the most tough thing to do. It's very easy to take a tablet, but it's very difficult to follow and advise of the diet. And the sweets, which are your enemy and poison, are very, very, their, their addiction to sweets is like marijuana's addiction. People want some sweet every day after meal. I'll go to the next one. Thank you. Uh, Uma yeah. Pai says, uh, but intermittent fasting is intermittent fasting advisable at 76, comorbid and on insu insulin, I assume. I, I don't know what that question is really. 
So I can see your mind. Yeah? Yeah, I'm uh, 20 years on diabetic uh, medication. And of course, I finished my uh, mastectomy 20 years ago, full mastectomy. Of course, I keep a healthy lifestyle. And uh, so uh, I want to know whether I could do the ECG. How often do I have to do since I have both these? Uh, I'm on insulin. Uh, plus now, of course, the cancer medication has stopped after 10 years. Uh, I go for mammo and, you know, uh, even that also they say not necessarily don't come out the cell doctors. So my gosh, because I'm keeping good, but then this ECG, ECG, should I repeat like uh, once in six months, one day a year? Or? Uh, you know, your question about um, how often can you do an intermittent fasting also probably is added to this. Um, I would say that if your body weight is good, and your insulin, uh, your glucose is well controlled, your glycosylated hemoglobin is less than 6.5, then your diabetes is under control. So if you're, yeah. if you're in that range, then you're actually pretty okay. Now, if yeah. you're taking insulin for that, although I feel that the treatment of diabetes with insulin is one or not one of the best ones, you can, now there are newer drugs, like the, uh, the, what are the SGL2 inhibitors, which are better drugs, and then use the complication of diabetes. So you should meet your diabetologist and you should know about these drugs and they, you should be put on those drugs if possible. As far as ECG is concerned, if you don't have heart disease, you don't have to take ECG every three months. Once in a year is enough. Uh, but if you are a diabetic, I would say definitely once a year, you should do your ECG echo both. Uh, yeah. We are often, Raj Gopal, we are often advised to eat smaller portions more often. Is this wrong? I think you've answered this already. Um, yes. Yeah. Uma Pai is already answered. Amit, no, but if you eat, if you don't eat a carbohydrate rich diet, so if you want to eat, suppose you eat, and you know, unfortunately, what people eat, you tell me, they eat tea. I mean, you see a software company in front of there, there is a chai shop, and every two hours, these people are coming to smoke and drink tea. What are they drinking? Tea is not tea. They are drinking sugar, yes. and they are smoking. So this is very bad for them, 100% very bad for them. I mean, they're all obese. If you see 70% of them will have a huge, uh, you know, belly. Amit Jindal asks, I've heard that salt causes hunger, which leads to overeating and hence diabetes. What's your opinion on salt-free diet? <laughs> no, I don't think I agree with that. Salt is required for you. Salt gives you resistance, salt gives you immunity. Your body requires three to five grams of salt per day, unless you have hypertension or you have kidney disease, you should not stop salt. You take some salt, natural salt in the vegetables is enough. You don't need to eat extra salt, but salt is required for you and salt-free diet is not going to give you any benefit. Salt is good for you. Salt reduces the chances of infection in your body. So some amount of salt you have to take, but no extra salt. Uh, Narendra Lodha, can we take cow ghee? Yes, you can. See, ghee for seasoning is not bad. It's probably the best organic food you can eat in terms of seasoning your food. Now, if you start drinking ghee, I would probably not recommend. No. <laughs> Ayurveda does tell you, and once in a while, to purify your bowel, to lubricate your bowel, they do... You know, the panchakarma they do, where they make you drink ghee. It changes your bowel. Your gut is the most important part of your body. Please don't forget. Gut is called as the second mind. And the science has started learning it now. Ayurveda has known it for a long, long time that the gut cleaning which they do is very important. How often shall I get full body checkup done to identify uh, conditions in time? How often? The body checkup is going to give you information, but you have to be... You have to be told about by a doctor who understands what is to be told, number one, and you have to follow that advice. Yeah. So first of all, you have to find a doctor who will look at your data and give you the correct advice because just a body checkup doesn't mean anything. But once a year for somebody who's a diabetic and once uh, in two years, somebody who's not a diabetic is enough. Okay. Uh, I will repeat the question. Please ask a question these days of being told, don't drink milk. Now, I wouldn't say that the milk is bad for you. You can take 250 ml to 300 ml mm -hmm. per day. And the milk should be, if you really look at the organic milk is good for you. But unfortunately, what the cow eats 
is important. And it is very difficult to find good quality milk. So if you have a Jersey cow, which has got high fat content, then you should remove the fat by boiling it two, three times and use it, that's fine. But the Indian cow probably is the oh, best Indian. cow, has got good food in it, is not a bad idea. And the milk, 300 grams of milk is a good source of protein and calories. I don't miss mix sugar in it. That coming from an organic source, it is fine. Advice on basic first aid for treating heart attack. So first of all, if you suspect that you may be having some symptoms related to heart, like a discomfort in your chest, breathing difficulties, suffocation, which is usually happening in the middle of the night, you should raise an alarm. You should ask your family to get up and tell them that I'm having some discomfort. And the first thing which you can do is take a 300 milligrams of aspirin, which you can keep. This will protect a lot of complications and make arrangement to reach the nearest hospital as, for, as early as possible, get an ECG done and your heart attack will be confirmed. Mm -hmm. If there is doubt, the doctor should not send you home saying that there is gas. They should do one more ECG and they should do an enzyme test, which is called as a drop eye test. First aid for a heart attack is only a tablet of aspirin at home. And the next important thing is to reach hospital. Nothing else will work. Yeah, uh, I'll go to the next one. Um, um, Geeta Bhatt, thank you. Uh, very educative, explained in very simple terms. Uh, then Krishna Menon, whether the present readings of sugar below 90 fasting and below 130 random are all right. I think that is obvious. Um, Renu Prasad, I want to know that my fasting sugar always shows high, but post prandial is within range. I take metformin two times. So, in the beginning of the diabetes, the fasting sugars go up and then the diabetes gets manifest. So if you have early onset of early diabetes, fasting sugars are usually high. What is important is your glycosylated hemoglobin, which should be below seven for you to not go on medicine. But if you take metformin, it's a good drug to take. Metformin has been known to increase age and a lot of people take as a as a as an increasing the age drug once a week so metformin you can take and continue to take and your sugars are pretty good so you shouldn't worry about it if your glycosylated hemoglobin remains below 6.5 preferably below 6.5 yeah uh, the next question is from cp it says i don't know are supplements good for health um most of us are deficient in vitamins, like vitamin D is the most common deficiency and it's important to correct it. And most of us do not go in sun and that's a problem. We remain indoor and that is why our vitamins are low. Most of the people take unnecessary vitamins. That is also not good. If you are a deficient person who are recovering from an illness, you have had some kind of infection, you have some pneumonia, You've, you've gone to a hospital where you were treated for surgery or some surgery was done, you will all need supplement for some time. But uh, probably I would recommend that every two to three months you can take some supplement and stop it and then take it again and stop it. You don't have to take continuously all the supplements. But vitamins and minerals are important. They usually are there in fruits and vegetables. Uh, so if you eat raw fruits and vegetables, you'll get all the supplements. And they are better sourced than what you take in the form of a tablet or a capsule. Chitra Venkatesh asks, does TMT rule out an attack? No, does not. Okay. It only rules out that you not have disease, which is significant. So if you have a 70% blockage, your TMT will be positive. If you have a 30-40% blockage, your TMT would not be positive. And you will still be able to suffer. It's the vulnerable plaque which is likely to rupture. Now the whole science is spending time how to find these people. So those people who smoke like a chimney, those who drink too much, eat very fatty food, their food is nothing but oily, spicy biryani all the time and these things like that. They have these plaques which are rich in fat and they are more likely to rupture. And unfortunately, usually it happens after a heavy meal, late night parties, early hours of morning, people coming back saying I have had some chest pain last night and they suffer a heart attack. The yeah. question is what dietary would you suggest? As you mentioned, small intake at regular intervals is not advisable. No, 
but most of the doctors suggest the same you also said this concept will change in 2 3 years what should we do wait for 2 3 years and change after that i mean he's a little confused so i suggest that you should not eat in between that is important you can take three meals per day try remove sugar from your diet try to remove simple sugars from your diet as far as possible eat organic food without processed food avoid taking food made up made out of processed wheat if possible every time you go out do not indulge in eating all the time that burgers and 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 the puffs and the uh, it's better to eat a idli and a vada it is much better and but avoid eating all the time so if you eat multiple time there's a problem i recommend that those who eat at least 3 days a week make the light night dinner only fruits even if you have diabetes it will help you take away the un from your diet as far as possible eat as far as possible raw food and semi cooked food don't overcook your food right avoid eating lot of curry in your food you remember most of us eat rice and chapati with salted curry this is our food i say remove that curry so you can't eat rice you cannot eat just without mixing with salty food remove don't make rice as your staple diet if so if your plate has so much of rice and only few vegetable that is bad food eat rice i'm not saying stop eating that but eat rice which is not the the whole rice the red rice which you people eat especially the mangalorians eat or the keralites eat that's a good rice but they also eat fish with it and they don't eat processed fish fish they actually i i went to kerala and these people said no we will not buy fish from this fellow this fellow sells all the restaurants there sell fish which is stored in refrigerators so they eat their fish by catching it from next to the water and that is all right Uh, red meat all the time no no so eat less don't eat again and again and if you suppose are somebody who has got diabetes or sugar level falls because you don't eat that means you're taking too much of medication you reduce the medication you will not fall there's a question or there's a mention from sujata is troponin p test must for any heart pain uh, i don't know what that is it's more important for a doctor to pure, to confirm it troponin t is done when you go with a heart a symptom like heart attack to a hospital where they will do your troponin to confirm are you having a heart attack so it's not a test for a patient but it's a test for a doctor to decide whether you have heart attack or not uh, kavita uh, is asking uh, do we need to reduce carbs sugar salt oil for ldl as i have ldl of 186 and total of 261 and bp 14400 do i need medication if you're not a diabetic your cholesterol levels which require treatment are different if you are a diabetic your cholesterol levels which require treatment are different we usually recommend that your ldl level should be below 130 and those who have heart disease or those who have diabetes their cholesterol levels ldl level should be below 90 preferably below 70 so if your levels are not below that you should take a drug and this will prevent you from suffering a heart attack and also yes you should reduce the salt intake but do not remove the salt intake and absolutely i recommend i don't take sugars for many many years so don't take sugar stop eating sweets that's it please advise on sweeteners like sucralose and stevia no 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 so your addiction to sweet is a problem take away that addiction great if you don't take sweet you will not like sweet in next two months i can guarantee once you stop eating you don't like sweet i i want to tell you something personal sir about uh, yeah. 15 years ago i stopped adding sugar to my milk so today by mistake if somebody put sugar in my milk i can't drink, I can't drink it, it. <laughs> i can't drink it <laughs> Okay. Does uh, Lena Jacob does tablets for cholesterol have side effects? Yes, they do have side effects, and the doctors have to watch for them. Uh, they are not those side effects which will harm you, 
Uh, there are side effects like leg fatigue sometimes. There is a slight increase in precipitation of diabetes with certain drugs. Um, so we do recommend that you should be taking these under the supervision of a cardiologist or a doctor rather than taking yourself. Um, and what levels to be treated. But as I said, the most important part is changing the lifestyle and reducing the risk. Drugs do help. Question from Madhu Jain. Uh, what new developments can we expect in heart treatment in the near future? New developments. I mean, a lot of things are happening. So what is the, that which is coming up in the next few years? What do you see? So the, how to regress these plaques which we develop and how to detect them early and how to detect plaques which are likely to rupture and create a heart attack is the new science. You can, you can see them which are likely to rupture. We already have technology to see them now to decide whether this plaque is likely to rupture. There are other, other markers of inflammation which can be picked up in the body, which will suggest you that you may, you're at higher risk of having a heart attack. So the new science is towards what can we do to pick up these early signs of who is likely to get a heart attack? For example, a sort of gangly got a heart attack and a person who is same kind of disease, worse than him, will never get a heart attack. So what happens? So this understanding is becoming better and it will improve. The new technology, like for example, we have started putting valves now without surgery. We can put a valve without operation. The next would be that you take a biogenic heart, a heart which is genetically engineered, which will your body will not reject, grown in a pig. Wow. <clears throat> it's possible. It will happen ultimately. Or a heart take out from a cadaver and reactivate and put it back in. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, Raj Shekhar is taking calcium tablet going to increase plaque. I think a lot of people take calcium without knowing their vitamin D levels. If you take calcium, if your vitamin D remains low, it is of no use, number one. And unnecessary, you should not take calcium. If you're deficient in vitamin D, you take vitamin D, don't take calcium. Calcium, of course, in a post-menopausal women and people who don't go out should be probably given, but not continuously, maybe two, three months a year, um, you should take calcium to replenish the demand which you have. Activity is more important. The most common cause of osteoporosis in women is inactivity. No exercise, only working at home and cooking food is not exercise. Uma Pai says, but we have so many others to eat, millets, red rice, dalia, quinoa, buckwheat, broken matta, red rice, etc. So is this all all right, is what she's asking. Yeah, this is all right, but that too also not to be taken every two hours. <laughs> Replacement. Yeah. Sujata says, what yes. is negative less than 0 0.03 troponin T test meaning? What does it mean? That you're not having a heart attack, that's all. Okay. Uh, I am Boom Tumor. I don't know who this is. So thanks a lot for the informative talk. Can jaggery be a suitable alternative to sugar? More organic, but no. Okay. Yeah, you can so, take. I mean, if you want to take, you take a bit of sugar. It's not that I'm saying that don't take it once in a while. It's fine. You don't take normally sugar in your diet. There is no consumption of sugar in your house. But if you go to somebody's house and he offers a tea, first of all, you'll not be able to drink. But if there is something, you can take it. There is not, it's not like a compulsion that you don't take it. But then as far as possible, 90 days, 90% uh, of your time, you should not take sweets. Once in a while is okay. Once in a while you take a chocolate, what's going to happen? But that once in a while is once a week, it will become too much. Okay. Uh, somebody by name CP is asking, I don't know, uh, when should one have breakfast, lunch, and then dinner to have best health? Probably the timing part. Yeah, so if you keep more than 12 hours a gap between your last meal and the first meal that you have done some fasting. And especially if you exercise before you take a breakfast, then you have increased the growth hormone level and reduced the insulin level more. The insulin and the growth hormone go opposite. So when you take a late dinner and sleep, the insulin secretion will reduce the growth hormone level in your body the growth hormone is responsible for making your body regenerate. Insulin is only causing 
uh, you know, insulin resistance. So uh, early dinner before 7, 7.30 and don't sleep immediately after dinner. A lot of people eat late dinner and sleep. That is very, very bad. You should eat early dinner and sleep after three hours. And if you can, suppose you eat last meal at 7.30 and next meal next morning, eight o'clock, you have given about 12 hours of fasting. So once a week you do fasting, you take a brunch, take a 10 o'clock meal and then don't eat that day. Or you eat at 10 o'clock and eat the second meal at six o'clock and you want to eat two meals per day, then you have actually not feel hungry so much and you can control it better. Once a meal, once a day a week, once a week, one meal, maybe a heavy breakfast, but yes, dinner has to be skipped. Uh, there's a question from Mr. P.K. Golcha. What is your advice on angio CT scan? Pretty good advice. I would say it's become a very good tool. And people who have high risk, for example, strong family history, smokers, uh, high cholesterol, at least three risk factors. They have high blood pressure, diabetes, and smoke. Um, it's a good test to look for. So they, we call them intermediate risk. It's a very good test to rule out disease. And I would recommend that there's no harm in doing it. You can pick up early disease and you can alter the progression of that disease. So CT is not a bad idea. But once you have a positive CD, I think you go in for an angiogram again. Is that right? No, not necessarily. So um, if you have mild disease, you don't need to go for an angiogram. You just know that, yes, I have disease. I have to change my lifestyle to so become more committed. So that's the reason, it, that's the way it works. Yes. Uh, any connection between the uh, this uh, COVID and uh, heart problem? Very much. Um, COVID has resulted in a lot of cardiomyopathy, dysfunction of the heart. People develop heart attacks during COVID times. Um, so COVID increased your uh, tendency to clot blood. So I talked to you about that in those arteries, when the blood will clot, you will get a heart attack. So you have a pre-existing disease and COVID increased your capacity to cause clotting, you suffered a heart attack. So the heart attack evidence, heart attack did happen in COVID. The second thing nowadays we are seeing the second strain which has come that it is oh. causing more cardiac dysfunction. It's leading to uh, you know, people suffering with high heart rates and becoming breathless is caused by COVID. Um, oh. this, is, this is the extra, you know, other respiratory manifestations. So yes, yes, COVID was associated with increased incidence of other heart illnesses, not necessarily heart attacks. But yes, since eight months I am on the COVID. Uh, this thing, sir, recovering now. Since nine months I am uh, suffering from COVID, sir. Yeah, it's called as long COVID. It doesn't go away. Yeah, long, very long COVID. Yeah, it's a your heart rate would not settle. You get an ECG and echo done. That's all. If they are normal, you need to go anywhere. Oh, okay. thank you so uh, much, sir. Thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, Amit Jindal says, I've heard that gluten found in wheat mimics insulin and leads to insulin resistance. So is it safe to eat wheat free? Doctor? Gluten free. Uh, I think it's meaning gluten free, yes. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think he's right. In the last 50 years, the the various Monsamos and all these companies who created hybrid products increase the amount of weight of grain in the plant of wheat. So the plant became short, the grains became more, and the content the grain contains, they have a substance called uh, glycopectin, which is three types, glycopectin one, two, three. So when you have more three, it's like simple sugars. And especially when you get processed atta, the machine which pulverizes it, separates the husk completely. The germ layer goes away. So what do you eat? We eat from the packet carbs, it's simple sugar. You're eating sugar, sweet. Um, next question is- So he's Raj. right. And of course, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Raj. Uh, next question is from Kavita. Uh, again, sir, these- Go ahead, Raj. Yeah. Uh, sir, these days, most of the oils are kind of adulterated. Do you suggest the use of oil generated directly from raw materials, uh, groundnut, coconut, etc.? There is there is a lot of oils in the market which we use. Which one to yes. use probably? Adulteration and all that. So first of all, 
use oil only for seasoning as far as possible. If you can, what you talked about, the oil from the natural sources, which are good, groundnut, and those days when people used to make, uh, their, you know, get their own oil is good. Now there are machines available which you can make your oil at home, but most of the processed oils again are processed, but we have no option because it's not easy to get all these things. It's got a lot of work required. So I would say that for seasoning as far as possible, use oils. Otherwise, frying you remove from your diet and don't keep oil for frying again. That's the worst thing you do. That's called as trans fatty acids. So don't keep the same oil frying. You have to throw this oil and use again. Once in a week, once in a while, frying is not a problem. Once in a while, a samosa is okay. Once in a while, uh, all these things are okay. But then whatever you buy from outside, they use the same oil, like all the hot chips people, they're using the same oil to fry again and again and again. And that is not good for you. Okay. Next question is from Shiba Chabba. What lifestyle changes would you suggest for mitral, mitral valve regurgitation? No, there is no lifestyle change which can help, of course. The only thing which you can reduce is that your body weight is more, you reduce your weight because that leakage can be reduced. And the second thing is if the leakage is significant, it needs change, it needs, the valve needs change. So overweight, uh, any valve disease in overweight people is a problem. So if you reduce your weight, your valve disease may tolerate it better. The intermittent fasting, that's what I want to know. Since I live alone, they say don't eat very early. Because you may go into hypoglycemia uh, since I'm on insulin also. So that's why I eat by nine. Oh, okay. I suppose it's okay. No, I think you need to alter the amount of insulin you take if you're you're eating, you're fasting. So on the day of, for a diabetic, the intermittent fasting is different. And most yeah. of the diabetologists don't understand it right now. It is available to only few in the world right now who understand this technology. The diabetologists still have not adapted it. It will take some time, but they will adapt it. So your diabetologist- Something they can read and understand, doctor? There's enough to, uh, you can listen to a chap called Jason Fung. Yes. Uh, what suggestion will you give for the food cycle for those who are working at night shifts and sleep most of the time during the day? <laughs> yeah. um, unfortunately, it's a bit of an abnormal pattern of life, I must say. But a job is a job. Uh, so obviously, you have to sleep during the daytime. You have to adjust your meal patterns accordingly. But uh, because sun is important for us, that light which comes and goes is part of our circadian rhythm. So your circadian rhythm is different, um, but you have to adjust in a such a way that um, if you're, you're going for work, then you have to eat and work. And when you come back, you eat a bit and sleep. And that's what I would recommend. So you have to reverse your pattern. Of course, that pattern is, cannot be sustained forever. You have to come out of it for some time and then go back to that pattern. But unfortunately, it was a job. And if you work that way, you can't avoid it. So I would say you have to reverse the pattern. Yeah. Rajkumar, I just want to tell one thing that I, I have always taken interest in people's life and to prevent disease. And I look at it as one of the possibilities in the future. Um, when the in, amount of interventions you can do, you go a bit older. And I think those who prevent disease become more important doctors. So I, my daughter helped me in, uh, you know, or helping in making this a reality in the future. And we have designed a program uh, through her company where we can alter people's life, advising them. So she has a website and they can probably send her. Can you please share that in nutritionist the board or some physical fitness experts on board? So I want to make. I will. I will forward it to you. Yeah. 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 Uh, maybe you can put it in the chat mode now. It'll be nice. Yes. www.integratedhealthmatrix.com. Yeah. Great. Who's speaking? Shilakshmi. Is there any 
No. Low BP is good. And low BP is no disease. <laughs> Sometimes doctors, see, when you go to a doctor and he's, you say, I'm not feeling well, I feel tired. And oh, yeah. they, they give you a reason for you to be explained. Low BP is no disease. Low BP is no problem. Actually, low BP is good for you. Unless the BP has become low because of a medicine, then it is not good. Then you have to reduce the medicine. We'll, uh, uh, as you suggested, we'll take it up uh, uh, separately offline. All the, if there's any question, we can take it up uh, subsequently. And uh, I am really uh, impressed that uh, apart from the talk, we gave so much more extra time to questions. And that was really interesting. Uh, a wide range of questions, uh, which really people wanted to know. And uh, that's a great thing. So uh, thank you for extending this, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, I know I, we had told you only 45 minutes, but it's got extended to quite a lot. Thank you so much. And I request uh, Madhu to do the hon honors of uh, uh, giving the formal vote of thanks, and we'll call it a day. Madhu, please un unmute yourself. Go ahead. This has been one of the most fascinating, and thoroughly informative, and engrossing conversation. I'm sure nobody wants to end it. We can see by the number of questions. So I'll be very brief, and I'll just say on behalf of C4C and all attendees and all those who will view this video subsequently, I heartily thank Dr. Sanjay Mehrotra for giving us so much time with all his heart. And I, for one, felt it touching my heart. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay Mehrutra. And on, on behalf of C4C, I also thank all the attendees and urge all of you to remember everything that you learned today and try your best to lead a healthier life. Because you know, true wealth is our health only and everything else is secondary. So thanks once again, take care. Stay safe. Shubharatri. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Sanjay. Thank you, everyone, for attending this and making it so interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.